All right, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the 2022 Equine Industry Symposium, Horses and Human Health and Learning. For those of you joining for the first time tonight, my name is Amanda McFarland and I'm an event marketing and communications professional and proud Bachelor of Bioresource Management graduate. This year, I've had the pleasure of teaching event management in the University of Guelph's Bachelor of Bioresource Management Equine Management Program and serving as part of the Equine Industry Symposium Committee. Whatever your role in our industry, everyone involved faces themes that are common to all of us and require our collective attention, such as the welfare and well being of the horse, the long term health and growth of our industry, and developing standards to keep abreast of legislation societal expectation, best evidence-based practices, and fiscal realities in order to get and stay ahead. The purpose of the University of Guelph's Equine Industry Symposium is to address long-term and big picture trends and issues in our industry. We're here seek to seek understanding, participate in open discussion, and examine diverse views. The symposium is hosted by students in the Bachelor of Bioresource Management program. They've been working all semester to help organize this event. Tonight, you'll hear from students, from incredible speakers, and from our featured speaker, Nina Ekholm Fry. Nina will be with us, has been with us throughout the event and um, facilitating each night. Nina, thank you so much for your efforts in putting the program together and facilitating the event. And with that, I'll pass it over to BBRM student, Zaina Tarawi to get us started. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, my name is Zaina Tarawi. And to start, I'd like to share some information about the Bachelor of Bioresource Management Equine Management Degree Program. The program is the first of its kind geared towards developing graduates who will go on to take management and leadership roles within the equine industry. The program is a blend of both business and equine science, including courses in anatomy, physiology, management accounting, equine nutrition, and microeconomics. One of the things I enjoy the most about the program is the hands-on opportunities that we are given, as well as the fact that the students in the program do not all have to have an equine-related background. Um, welcome back to the 2022 Equine Industry Symposium. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, our theme this year is Horses in Human Health and Learning. In our first session on Monday, featured speaker Nina Ekholm Fry and Dr. Katrina Merkies introduced us to the topic and provided an insightful overview. Last night, we heard from Dr. Katie Schroeder, a mental health professional, and Sarah Michelle Senecal, an occupational therapist, as we focused on therapy. To wrap things up tonight, we'll be learning about education and adaptive writing. Lynn Thomas, CEO of Arenas, Arenas for Change, will be discussing ways that interactions with horses can contribute to social emotional learning and personal growth. Then we'll, tack on the, we'll tackle on the confusing topic of adaptive riding, where Haley Edwards, Cantor Senior Instructor, will explain what adaptive riding is and is not. There will be a Q&A period after each of the speakers tonight, so please use the Q&A box for any questions. The entire session will be recorded and posted onto the BBRM program in the coming weeks. YouTube channel program in the coming weeks, sorry. Um, before we begin, if, there, if you were here on Monday and last night, you will have heard that we are giving away two prizes each night. I am pleased to announce yesterday's winners. The Schlees Saddle Refitting Voucher will go to Lydia Lawrence. The gift card to the tax, tax store provided by Golden Horseshoe PEMF Therapy will go to Akash Mirage. Congratulations. We will be reaching out to you via email to connect you with your price. Next, I would like to thank our um, sponsors and our partners for tonight. Ontario Equestrian and Equine Guelph are longtime partners of the symposium, helping to organize and promote the event. We want to say a special thank you to Hillary Gregory at Ontario Equestrian for her role in running uh, the Zoom platform and for the event and her colleague Taylor Cornwall for stepping in tonight. We would like to thank our returning platinum sponsor, KX94.7, Canada's number one country station radio, country radio station serving the communications of Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville, and the rest of the Golden Horseshoe from Niagara to the Western boundaries of Toronto, and home to the Canadian Country Music Association's 2014 Personalities of the Year, Tofen and Melissa. And thank you to Lee Saddleby Services and Golden Horseshoe PEMF Therapy, who have partnered with us this year as well. Thanks to their contribution, we are able to raffle off some fantastic prizes for tonight. By attending each night, you are automatically entered for our daily raffles. Schlee Saddlery has provided a free saddle fitting appointment to give away each night. These sessions are valued at $179 each. And the Golden Horseshoe PEMF Therapy is sponsoring our second raffle prize, which is a tax shop gift card. The winners from tonight's session will be announced on social media this week and will be contacted via email. 
In lieu of speaker events, we will be making donations to organizations that work with horses and human health and learning. And thank you to all of our incredible, incredible speakers for, for participating in this year's Equine Industry Symposium. As a reminder, there will be a Q&A period after each speaker tonight, and your questions can be entered in the Q&A section. Now I'm pleased to welcome back and introduce Nina Ekholm-Fry, our featured speaker from the University of Denver. Hi everyone, and welcome to the third day of a content and information packed equine industry symposium on the topic of horses in human health and learning. Uh, we've had two days prior to today and really focus on scientific and professional understanding of the ways that horses can be incorporated into human services. Uh, fortunately, all sessions have been recorded and will be available uh, via a dedicated YouTube channel in December, and you'll have an opportunity to catch up on the first few days if you were not able to attend. On day one, we set the stage for this whole topic area, including the concept of horses as part of human health and learning. We talked about terminology, how certain terms may be misleading in this professional area, such as using the term equine or horse therapy. That may sound like the horse is receiving services and does not indicate what the human service is, which is always either a human health care service like physical therapy or occupational therapy or psychotherapy, or a kind of learning services, an education and learning service. Uh, we will also, at the end of tonight, hear about a third area, which um, has a lot of confusion attached to it, adaptive riding or therapeutic riding. And I will go ahead and just for a recap, show you the overview for, from our previous days here. Again, our focus has been on therapy um, in the second day, where we learned what it is like to incorporate horses into healthcare services where credentialed masters and doctoral level clinicians um, make use of equine movement in the case of occupational therapists and physiotherapists and speech pathologists, or make use of equine interactions, as is the case with psychotherapy and counseling, and the various professional standards and competencies for doing this as part of healthcare. And that really set the stage clearly for tonight's topic, which is around learning. Uh, meaning services that are not therapy or treatment, because again, the service and service provider makes the service, not the fact that horses are incorporated. So we'll hear an, about an array of various learning services. These are not treatment or therapy services, but promote personal growth or academic or scholarly learning or social emotional learning who we'll do so from the excellent Lynn Thomas. We will also cap our industry symposium and tonight by looking at this category, which you see I've sort of shaded out or kind of highlighted in a different way because learning or having access to horsemanship and riding, the terms adapted riding or adaptive riding and the term therapeutic riding all mean the same things. And this is technically not a human health or learning service. This is a riding or an horsemanship, an equine uh, industry service that simply provides access to recreating with and perhaps sporting with horses for people who have disabilities that are either visible or invisible. And we're really lucky to have Haley Edwards to explain some uh, and clarify some of that confusion around the term therapeutic or adaptive riding uh, today. So with, and I wanted to remind you, I almost forgot again to, uh, to use the Q&A function, the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of, of the screen here to submit questions for our Q&A sessions. We will have 
two Q&A sessions, one for each speaker tonight. So directly following Lynn Thomas's topic on education and learning services, we'll have a Q&A dedicated uh, to that area. And after Haley Edwards' talk on adaptive or therapeutic writing, we'll have a Q&A dedicated there. So please go ahead as soon as a question comes to mind, please submit that um, so that we have time to review them and put together a nice Q&A session after each speaker. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Zaina. Perfect. Thank you, Nina. It is a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the night, educational speaker Lynn Thomas. Lynn Thomas is a licensed clinical social worker. She's accomplished much starting from co-founding EGLA, Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Asso Association, providing training for and certification in the EGLA model of incorporating horses in psychotherapy. She spent 21 years as a CEO before moving on. She's also co-founded and currently acts as CEO of Arenas for Change, an organization focused on value-based community learning and supporting one another and facilitation concepts that increase emotional safety and deepen client stories, bringing healing and change in mental health and overall, overall well-being. In 2021, Lynn also co-founded and is currently the president of Horses for Mental Health, which was created to expand the movement and uplift programs worldwide to impact and strengthen global mental health through horses. Lynn clearly has a real passion and vision for the impact that horses have on the well-being of us all and has devoted her life to share that way with that world. And now I'll pass it on for our first presentation. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Zena, for the introduction and to the symposium for the invitation to present. I'm honored to talk about what I think is a very exciting area, the role of horses in education and learning services. So this presentation will cover the what, who, and how of incorporating horses in education and learning, the horse preparation considerations, and you will hear examples of what sessions might look like throughout the presentation. So on uh, day one, Nina introduced the, uh, and discussed the importance of clear term terminology, and she was just sharing about that again. Um, you can see here that this is a little different graphic. She referenced the published consensus document, and this graphic comes directly from that document. So I'm using that. The reference is on the slide. Um, and basically, it identifies the three broad areas that Nina just showed as well, therapy, learning, and horsemanship, and within those areas, specific services and terminology. In the learning area, it identifies equine assisted learning in education, personal development, and organizations. So I feel the paper uh, provides nice, concise definitions of these areas and services, including the what, how, and who. So I thought we'd start with reading those definitions. So, uh, and again, this comes from the published paper. Equine assisted learning in education engages people of all ages in learning processes that focus on academic skills, character development, and the promotion of relevant life skills such as problem solving and critical thinking skills. Professionals providing these services should have extensive knowledge, training, or certifications related to learning theory and teaching methodology. To address the needs of groups of students, these professionals may develop contracts with schools um, <clears throat> or school systems and integrate specific educational strategies, which may support individual education plans and academic remediation. So that's the definition of the education service area of incorporating courses. So equine assisted learning in organizations assist members of corporations, organizations, and other work groups build effective teams and leaders that enhance work dynamics and performance at multiple organizational levels. Professionals providing this service should have extensive knowledge, training, or certifications related to organizational theory, team building, strategic planning, or leadership development. To address the needs of clients, these professionals may also integrate various approaches of, or strategies, such as executive coaching, team building, or group retreats within their services. Okay, so that's the organizational area. And then equine assisted learning and personal development. 
assists individuals and groups discover new ways to face life challenges and opportunities by developing skills in effective problem solving, decision making, critical and creative thinking, and communication. Professionals provide providing these services should have extensive knowledge, training, or certifications in facilitation, coaching, and teaching. They should also clearly understand how their services differ from psychotherapy and counseling. To address the needs of clients, these professionals may integrate various approaches or strategies, such as personal coaching and wellness-related activities within their services. So while this published consensus document doesn't focus on service first language in this learning area, like it indicates in the therapy area, it can be beneficial to also incorporate service first language in this area for the same reasons, to clearly identify the professional service that is being provided. The term equine assisted does not make this a standalone service, but rather horses and elements such as movement and interaction are incorporated or included in the services as one of the techniques being utilized to reach educational and personal development objectives. For instance, we may say developing teams or executive coaching incorporating horses or social, social emotional learning in an equine environment to further bring clarification of what we're providing. So we're gonna look at what this service area, what it isn't and what it is. So it isn't objectives to learn horsemanship or riding. It is goals that are specific to the education and learning objectives. So like the therapy area that was talked about yesterday, what is important to highlight is that the goals in this area are not equine focused, such as learning horsemanship or riding. Rather, the goals are specific to that particular learning objective such as forming positive relationships, improving school performance, strengthening communication skills, or learning and applying strategies to identify and manage emotions. This is different from adaptive writing, which has the primary goal of helping participants attain horsemanship skills. Adaptive writing may have therapeutic, and I know we're gonna learn a lot more about that later, but adaptive writing may have therapeutic or learning benefits and likewise, in learning sessions, students may learn about horses. Some sessions could look similar as horsemanship or riding activities may be utilized in a learning session. However, while it may seem like a small difference, it is actually quite significant the need for clarity on the goals as it determines how the process is facilitated and what interventions are chosen. Um, yeah, so often I've seen the EAL, equine assisted learning term applied when what is happening is a focus on learning horsemanship. So again, while teaching horsemanship may be part of an intervention in an EAL session, the facilitator stays focused on the primary learning objective and adjusts and provides interventions that best help meet that objective, whether or not the student learns about horses. So another uh, thing that it isn't, it isn't health, healthcare or medical treatment. However, it is a professional service requiring training and specialization. So while the learning area is not healthcare or medical treatment, which would define the therapy area, practitioners in this education learning area also need professional training in their particular service area and provide services within their scope of training and practice. Insurance may cover therapy as a healthcare service, but would not cover learning services. Um, and perhaps, uh, yeah, at least that's in the US, so I'm not sure about Canada, but generally insurance would not cover things that are not healthcare or medical treatment. So services tend to be paid for through private pay, fundraising, and strategic partnerships when it comes to the education and learning area. So it isn't psychotherapy or counseling. It is focused on skill competency building and maximizing personal and professional potential. So this is a common area of discussion, especially with the rise of life coaches and peer specialist services, such as sponsors and 12-step recovery programs and other peer support programs on the differences and boundaries with psychotherapy and counseling. Learning services, particularly personal development, are in a similar realm that include benefiting mental and emotional health. 
Broadly, therapy tends to address past issues, which are impacting the present and may focus on mental illness diagnoses, whereas the learning area tends to focus on present and future goals and the skills, resources, and steps to achieve those goals. Um, there could be a lot more discussion in this area. And so, um, but I think the key in this is professional training in one's specialization needs to include awareness and understanding of the goals, types of interventions, and scopes of service, as well as holding to, to professional ethical codes. Incorporating horses does not change the professional standards of these services. What is especially beneficial is that the education learning and the psychotherapy counseling services can complement each other really well. I've talked with several programs who, for instance, incorporate learning programs as pre-therapy or post-therapy programs. So to summarize, education and learning services focus on learning skills, solving problems, setting and working towards goals, strengthening relationships with self, others, and environment. So what is especially exciting about the education learning area of services is how broad and diverse it is. There are so many ways horses are being incorporated to benefit different learning objectives and needs. And it really is only limited by your professional training, vision, creativity, and passion. The following is a, a small sampling of programs providing different types of services in education, organization, and personal development areas. Hopefully this will give you an idea of programs that may be offered and also inspire you to discover your ideas and passion in how you might incorporate horses in education and learning objectives to benefit your communities. If you do have an interest in learning more about any of the programs presented next, the websites are included so you can reach out to them. They have all given their permission to be in this presentation and are happy to share about their programs, as well as some, some of them offer training programs and their specializations also if that is of interest. Also, um, let's see, okay, I think that's where our, we'll just move on and look at what these different uh, possibilities are in this, in this area. So in the education area, uh, this is an example of a program called Horse Powered Reading, which integrates social and emotional learning with academics, teaching literacy and math, allowing students to see and experience reading and math skills with their entire mind, body, and emotions. Um, I really like this graphic as well that um, from this program because it focuses on um, some of those uh, focuses in learning to read. Uh, it starts with a few reading, a few key reading skills, and then looking at motivation, looking at pers uh, persistence, self -effic and self-efficacy are some of the things they cover in this program. Dr. Michelle Piquel is the creator of this program and is a literary education professor at Concordia University. And she shared an example of how this could look. Um, and she talked about how learning to read is about relationships, relationship with the book, with the words, with the content. So when a student chooses a horse, they are choosing a relationship, which ends up becoming very much like the relationship they have with books. As they develop that relationship and take the horse on different journeys, they may encounter obstacles, just like in reading a book. You might become stuck with a word or lack lack of comprehension or there's distractions in the environment. So working with horses very much supports the journey of learning to read. Um, this program is now being facilitated in all 50 US states and over 18 countries. Uh, Michelle also shared an interesting story about one of the facilitators who works with blind students learning to read braille. And as one example, the student would read a part of the horse word in Braille and then find that place on the horse. So that just gives some, some little ideas of how horses are being incorporated to achieve these kind of academic goals. Um, another example in the education area, this is Strides to Success and um, some other offerings that they have. They have a character development curriculum, partnering with schools, incorporating a learning model that includes core standards, developmental assets and character education. This nationally recognized program can provide students with school credit, 
So, and some of the character development skills that they learn in that uh, character development include create an excitement about learning, improve attitudes and willingness to learn, build life skills, such as respect, responsibility, and integrity, communicate more effectively, develop problem solving skills, increase self-worth and value and demonstrate positive behaviors. And just to give another example of another program they have there, the kid coaching program is one-on-one -on -one interaction with a horse and a trained certified coach where kids have the opportunity to learn and practice life skills that can deal with uh, difficult behaviors such as respect for all living beings, responsibility for self-kindness to others, self-regulation for the get, uh, greater good, asking for help and accountability for lifelong success. This is a third example in the education area. Yeehaw is a bullying and suicide, and they call bully side, intervention and prevention curriculum partnership with school and staff members, which include teachers, counselors, parents, and administration to reduce bully side for a safer school environment. Uh, Yeehaw's curriculum is intertwined with the school discipline where students get credit hours towards graduation. Using a school discipline or or as an elective course. Language arts, such as language arts, health, mathematics, technology, and arts. Yeehaw gives the student the opportunity to have a voice to bring personal creativity into a class subject. Yeehaw's uh, curriculum incorporates horses and other animals. Students develop positive psychology, personal growth in self and others, team building and problem solving skills, empathy, connection, and resilience. Uh, those who complete the Yeehaw program um, are, and I thought this was a really neat part of their program. They are able to submit their portfolio, which is a short documentary film. So part of the academic is learning filmmaking and um, they make a film that is submitted into a contest sponsored by the Utah Film Center. And the documentary film is of their personal feelings of a life relevant story that they created with the horses. And uh, one, one other example in the education area, medicine and horsemanship, which teaches medical students and healthcare professionals communication, teamwork, leadership, and self-care through each pe person's unique interaction with horses and activities that represent metaphors for clinical scenarios. So in other words, it's a curriculum that teaches uh, medical uh, students and professionals bedside manners, which I think is is really neat. This, this program was originally created by Dr. Alan Hamilt Hamilton, then chief of neurosurgery at the University of Arizona, and then furthered into a training manual and course by Dr. Beverly Kane, who is a phys physician specializing in many areas of medicine. This program has been provided as a seven week class for Stanford University medical students for the last 19 years. And practitioners now trained in this program are providing uh, these types of programs to support healthcare professionals for over 15 medical centers nationally. So moving to the organization area, and just again, to give some examples of what's possible in, in this area. Um, Horses for the Corporate World, they um, utilize certified individual and team coaches. And through that, they provide workshops for leaders and executive level teams utilizing a mindset of story, incorporating horses. And I said, there's always a good story behind a strong team. So um, they gave an example of what this might look like. Uh, Annie Ricalde, who's one of the founders of this program, um, they were doing a, a team development with a large multinational corporation. And the participants who were coming were coming from different countries. And their goal was making things happen, not just talking about it. So um, one of the things they do working through a mindset of story is they invited the team to title what the experience will be. And this was a day long experience, uh, but they decided that the title of their experience would be make it happen. And one example of what they did during this um, day long experience and how they incorporated the horses is um, they first, invited the group to observe and identify how their own individual stories were being played out through the horses. And then they were invited to pull those individual stories into a team story. They determined that 
that to make that team story that they needed to bring the horses together in a specific area they had identified. And that's what was needed to, as the title said, make things happen or make it happen. So, um, however, the horses didn't come together. So they had to come up with some new ideas and through that process and through the discussion of that process, they discovered that they needed to change the location and the processes processes they were utilizing to make things happen. And through that, they discovered one of their key strengths as individuals and as a team is that they're capable of adapting and changing to be whatever they wanted to be. So another example on the organization side, uh, Red Horse Center for Collaborative Leadership. Um, they have several different offerings as well, but I thought these were um, especially interesting is their focus on corporate uh, organizational and individual culture. And um, so a healing culture through a trauma-formed lens is one of the workshops they offer with, with organizations. And it focuses on the principles of trauma-informed care as a paradigm shift for the care of self and others professionally and personally. And um, empowering an intentional company culture and enhancing collaboration and creativity. So another offering they do, widening our world views, or WOW, is an implicit bias training focused on reducing barriers and disparity, uh, dispar disparities in access to and delivery of healthcare services in support of the training requirement. Um, so this is what's kind of neat is in, uh, where they are in Michigan, there is now a, a requirement in healthcare services to get diversity and inclusion training. And so they have met the requirements in order to offer this kind of program through uh, learning about diversity and inclusion through the horses. Um, I know on day one, it was uh, talked about how horses have their own cultures and what better way to increase self and cultural awareness than with horses. An example of one activity that um, was shared by Red Horse that they do in their workshops to address this is, um, for instance, they invite the group to observe the herd and go out and introduce themselves. And then in storybooks, they jot down three to five characteristics that they found themselves drawn to, drawn to in those horses. After doing that, they are then asked to now list the opposites of those characteristics. They, the, the facilitators list, them, list those on a whiteboard and they have discussion on how implicit bias lives in the opposites. We gravitate towards the things we are drawn to and like and the opposites can show subconscious behaviors and avoidances that can close us to other perspectives and cultures. The group is then invited to re-engage with the herd, find the opposites and spend time with them and what is learned and discovered through that process. So that's just a, another example of how horses are being incorporated in, in unique and creative ways. So just going into the personal development area, uh, Acres for Life, these are just some of the programs they offer. There's a a uh, women's empowerment program, focusing on connection with self and understanding limits, uh, limiting beliefs that may be barriers to reaching their potential. Uh, they kind of have a similar type of program called the AKA Sisterhood for fifth to eighth grade girls focused on connection with self, others, community world. Um, Dare to Rise uh, is based on the Daring Greatly book by Brene Brown and one of their uh, facilitators at Acres for Life is a professional who's certified by Brene Brown to teach uh, concepts from her books, uh, which includes shame, resilience, boundaries, and vulnerability. Um, and just to give a quick example there, um, there was a story of the Women's Empowerment Group. They decided to focus on their voice as one of the means of empowerment, to not be afraid or timid to use their voice and to feel like they're um, seen and heard. And they chose horses that felt like the characteristics of an empowered voice. And while developing the relationship with those empowered voices, which were the horses, they recognize as the horses, the way the horses responded to other horses or to different places in the spaces. Through that, they discovered the role trust in others and trust in their self played in how they use their voice. So. Um, just one other example of personal development and bridled way forward. They do herd meditation at the farm, reconnect with the natural world with guided meditation 
um, in a peaceful and serene setting with horses. They do uh, a bridal self journey for people ready to discover their authentic self and transform their life. And some of their objectives is get to get clear and know your next right next steps, regain purpose, enjoy in your life, have better relationships, feel connected to life and empowered to take action in your way forward. Um, they also do a peer support uh, experiences to address burnout for our healthcare professionals. So those are just some, what do all these examples have in common? They all were very clear of the service and objectives. And if you guys, I mean, they were very specialized niche services. The clarity of the services and the objectives is one of the things that has stood out for me. They are creatively incorporating the horses and horse environments as strategies to meet those objectives. These services are being provided by facilitators who are trained in that service area. They are also trained in horsemanship knowledge and skills. And they are trained in incorporating horses specifically in human development services. So ultimately, once you have this foundation of, of those um, things in providing services in the education and learning area, incorporating horses, your creativity and vision can take this in so many places. There are so many possibilities and it's very exciting to see what could what is possible and, and what you as practitioners, facility owners who might have an interest in this will create. Now benefits incorporating horses, this is something that asking the facilitators and different programs who are providing education and learning services. These are some of the things that they shared um, of why the horses are so impactful in this type of work. Um, experiential learning increases the engagement and retention of learning. And experiential learning in general can do that with that relationship with the horse adds an extra dynamic that really seems to increase engagement in a way that might not be seen e even in other experiential settings. Um, and it's been talked already before, it's playful. It feels emotionally safe, even though horses are big and can be physically intimidating and, and you would think clients feel fearful. And yet at the same time, maybe it's because uh, horses are, come across as feeling non-judgmental, whatever it is about the nature of the horse, it feels emotionally safe for clients in that space which increases learning. Um, the relationship itself and working through relationship, relationship is at the base of so many things in our learning and growth. And so the relationship with the horses and that dynamic aspect, the horse is a catalyst of change. And, and that the peaceful environment itself, both of the horses and the whole setting and, and environment plays a big role and the benefits that the horses are bringing in this type of work. Um, similar to what has been shared um, on horse preparation and considerations, um, recognizing that the horse's role in learning sessions especially can be very broad and varied, just like these services are very broad and varied. So being prepared that there's a lot of different ways horses might be incorporated. It covers pretty much the, just about everything. And so um, knowing that your horses are prepared for that. Sessions tend to be, although not always, on the ground and observations, uh, tend to be on the ground observations and interactions with the horses, possibly including equipment or other materials, props in the space, and typical horsemanship activities may be involved. Um, there's another resource that if there's a way to send a link, um, uh, we will send out a link that provides information on that. It's called the Herd Keystones. Uh, it's an additional tool developed by Arenas for Change that can add to what has already been shared in this symposium on horse welfare, care, and considerations. The Herd Keystones are holding space, experiential resonance, and dynamics, and provide a set of questions that equine specialists and those facilitating with horses can ask before, during, and after sessions that highlight and provide space for horses to bring their beneficial qualities to the process. And um, that, uh, that information is part of a longer, more extensive online course um, at arenasforchange.com. But um, again, if there's a way to share that, then we will uh, I'll get that link out to you guys for anyone who's interested in, in learning more and reading about that. All right.
So thank you again for this opportunity to spend this time with you. And I hope you are inspired to follow your dreams, incorporating horses in education and learning. I'll turn the time over to you, Nina. Wonderful, Lynn. Thank you so, so much for this talk. We are now going to go into the question and answer session specifically for serve education and learning services that include horses. We got lots of comments, lots of questions. I've done my best here to kind of consolidate into a, a workable uh, sort of five to 10 minutes here uh, with the two of us, Lynn. And the I think you were so clear in especially your comparison slide there that when we talk about these learning services, we're not talking about healthcare. We're not talking about mental health treatment. Um, a lot of questions were exactly about this. You know, the idea that mental health, um, what are the boundaries, you know, between what qualified psychotherapists can do, um, kind of words and terms should learning professionals talk about uh, psychiatric diagnoses and, and people who have sort of felt that confusion truly when they're seeking out um, a service for themselves. So I was curious, I, I think, again, there was lots of great things in your, in your um, presentation there, but if we could dialogue a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that has been a common problem. That's where I mentioned too, that um, sometimes you have horse facilities that may be teaching um, horsemanship and calling it even equine assisted learning without that really clear focus and clarity, both on the goal and the professional training to provide that type of service. So I think that's, I, and Nina, you know, I'll love your thoughts on this too, but I think that is one of the um, ways to really focus in on if you say you're providing, um, addressing uh, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, for instance, then really that is a mental health, uh, mental illness diagnosis. And to treat a mental illness diagnosis, you do need to be a mental health professional to do that. So I think if there is a lack of clarity, for instance, now, you know, a program may, like we said here, teach and train skills that can lead to emotional health, but we have to be so clear and not um, in our marketing indicating that we might be actually solving your PTSD problems. And yeah, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that as well, Nina. Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on there. Also in your talk about goals, you know, what are the goals and what professions or professional areas focus on which goals? I really liked your comparison there with adaptive or therapeutic riding and horsemanship. The goals are horse skills related. And in learning and education services like social emotional skill building uh, or literacy and reading, those goals have words that are connected specifically to those professional areas. And your example, I think, is spot on because around, you know, words like anxiety, uh, trauma, uh, we have to be quite careful in each of our of our countries here, I say, knowing that both of us live in the US and we're talking to a Canadian audience, each country have professional boundaries and distinctions, some of which are determined by law. And it is so important, as you're saying, to really, as a consumer, as a stakeholder, somebody who's seeking out services, to really pay attention to, is, is this a non- registered, qualified, master's or doctor level mental health professional who talks, just like you said, about trauma and anxiety or OCD or these words that belong to a certain, you know, healthcare industry. And, and I even took a little summary here as you were talking about those great examples that you provided, uh, you know, terms like communication, teamwork, leadership, corporate culture, confidence, self-care, motivation, self-knowledge, these words belong to learning professional areas, whether academic, special education, or life uh, coaching. But like you said, I think it's really sadly up to the consumer to keep a close eye out because just because horses are there, 
does not make that service therapeutic uh, and does not sort of supersede the necessary uh, training, which is important for public trust, you know, and, and, and confidence. Um, anything else to add there on the mental health kind of boundary between learning services and mental health? Yeah, I appreciate that you, you know, took some notes about those examples, because I think they are really good examples on top of showing the diversity of the types of services in this area. But yeah, they were very clear on what they were providing. They have that background and experience. So for instance, and, and I thought they gave good examples of what, like you just listed, really fits into the education learning area focus. So for instance, if I want to um, provide resilience training, um, to participants that would fit in this. I, although I need to also ask myself, do I have training and background to provide resilience training? And yeah, does resilience training going to help all these mental health areas that we talk about? Absolutely. It's going to help those different. That's why it complements so well. And I mentioned that some of these programs are providing even it's pre-train, uh, pre-therapy and post post therapy programs. But it, again, it's how we message it to the consumer that's so important. We have to be so clear that I'm providing resilience training and it's going to help benefit you in many ways. It cannot address the absolute root problems of your, your PTSD or your depression or your anxiety and that you do need to uh, go to a mental health professional to do that. Yes, yes. And keep, keep a close eye in your country about what boundaries different healthcare professionals have um, is extra important. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, a related question that came up quite a bit is around, you know, if I'm a person who's interested in working with people in a learning services setting, what, what should I, and I want to incorporate horses too, uh, what, what are some steps here? What should I, what should I do first? Can I just, you know, because I like people, can I uh, bring them over to my horses? What, what, what do you suggest? Yeah, I think first, um, decide what you're passionate about and in the service area. So if you're passionate about teaching or say teaching literacy or something like that, maybe start focusing in on getting education and background in a, in a teaching or academic area. So that's one thing to really be clear about. This is what I want to do. I want to work with clients um, uh, for their academic success, or I want to work with organizations. So I'm going to go in and get some training and certification in coaching and or team and executive coaching. So that's one thing to really look at. What are you passionate about? The second thing is training with horses. Now, I will share that I am, my background is not with horses. I've been doing this work for over 25 years now, but I can, I know just enough knowledge to probably be dangerous. So I always choose to work with a qualified equine specialist and in, in all that I do. However, I think it's still important that I have some knowledge of horses. So depending on the role you wanna play, you wanna get that, that training in the horse area. And then it's the training and how you combine horses and human development services. So there's a lot of different organizations. I was hesitant to even start listing them because that list continues to grow. Um, so, but look up training and certification in horses, uh, in, including horses in, um, in services to benefit people and see what you can find and look into that. So I don't know where there's a place to to give those kind of recommendations and I'll leave that to you as well, Nina, but definitely get that as well because you need those foundations. So those are the three places I think I would start. Yes, that's great. And, you know, connected to this question and we're coming to the end here of our, of our Q&A, but connected to that question, um, I can see that there's a lot of people who are, you know, wanting to help a certain population. They are not qualified healthcare professionals um, and really are thinking, you know, about, okay, how can I help them anyway? And I think in that example uh, too is exactly the steps that Lynn outlined. If you want to do some sort of service, a learning or, you know, self-development service here, you just having a horse there does not um, does not sort of bypass the need to have that solid human training uh, in the area that 
of interest, whether it's, you know, some sort of support service for a particular population or not being very careful to never misrepresent or use words that are sort of belong to the medical and mental health uh, fields there. And, and like Lynn is saying too, being knowledgeable about horses, and you might actually have to take your horse knowledge up a notch, uh, as opposed to just sort of having been around them in a leisure way, if we're talking professional services here, like social emotional skill building after school program for teenagers, you both need that human training, you need to know how horses uh, communicate, not just based on your personal experience, but professional and scientific resources that, for instance, University of Guelph, or among others, provide, and then the how, you know, how do I incorporate the experiential components, the relational components, like Lynn spoke about, in order to really enhance the that team building or that um, that um, adolescent um, service opportunity, and I think Lynn really gave such a good example there with the corporate team culture of you know sort of using movement and kind of visual cues to really think about what are we doing here in our work team, what kind of biases might we hold or not. Those are skill sets that are implicit in those professional learning roles. And you're just kind of bringing the horse in with specialized training there. And yes, thank you, Lynn, for saying there's lots of different places to pursue training. Uh, in Canada, in the US, in Europe, worldwide, look for those, what we're talking about, clear clarity around professional service and no promises of mental health sort of secretly in there, but really a, a clear frame. Uh, wonderful. I think that covered uh, a lot of our of our audience communication here. And Lynn, just a pleasure as always, as we've been colleagues for many years to to have you here. Thank will, you, Nina. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. I will now pass it on to Zeta. Thank you. Now on to our second speaker of the night. I'm pleased to welcome Haley Edwards. Haley Edwards is a certified Canadian Therapeutic Riding Association senior instructor. Um, equestrian Canada instructor of beginners and Cantra instructor mentor. She has over 14 years experience in the therapeutic riding and equine facilitated uh, learning industry. She has been a part of the urban stable team since 2014 and has recently taken on the role of ex executive director. She specializes in assessing teams and individuals to overcome barriers, build confidence and strengthen connections to their education organizations and community through and commun community through working with horses. She's inspired by and dedicated her work from her experiences and works to help teams, peers, and individuals recognize their unique cap capabilities through mentorship and leadership development. Urban Stables has clearly adored, uh, Urban Stables clearly adores her work and explains that her enth enthusiasm and passion and belief in people inspires them to become prouder, stronger, and more valuable uh, contributors to their school organizations and community. I will let Haley Edwards get with her presentation now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be presenting to you. I am the uh, last um, speaker. This is the last presentation of the um, 2022 Equine Industry Symposium on Horses in Human Health and Learning. And um, my name is Haley Edwards. I am the Executive Director of Urban Stable. Urban Stable is a registered charity. Uh, we're in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we provide adaptive or therapeutic riding and horsemanship to youth in grades five through eight that are facing obstacles and adversity. And I am a certified senior instructor with the Canadian Therapeutic Riding Association, and that is shortened to CANTRA. So tonight I'm going to be talking about adaptive or therapeutic riding, and we're going to be talking about what, what is adaptive or therapeutic riding, how is that delivered, um, who are the riders, who are the instructors, we'll talk about some of the training, we'll talk about horse considerations, and we'll also talk about, um, if we have time, a little bit of competition. So what is adaptive or therapeutic riding? 
Let's start off by saying they are the same thing. You can use the two names interchangeably. So adaptive or therapeutic riding is recreational horseback riding and horsemanship lessons that are adapted to each individual's ability, needs and learning styles. Riders gain education in riding and they also gain access to recreation and sport. The goals in therapeutic or adaptive riding are riding skill based and we utilize mounted and unmounted activities to provide a unique combination of physical and emotional benefits. Also um, are available are adapted driving and adapted vaulting if anyone is interested. The benefits of interacting with horses. Um, horses um, have been partners with humans for over 5,000 years, and they've taken us into battle. Um, they've provided us with transportation. They've helped us plow our fields. They've helped with logging. And now in recent years, they've opened up um, a wide range of equestrian sports. And the benefits of interacting with horses are very vast. And we're always learning new things from, from these animals. And adaptive or therapeutic riding opens up this world to um, people um, that uh, maybe are facing barriers and maybe, um, you know, wouldn't be able to access this. So the adaptive or therapeutic riding opens up this world. And some of the benefits, you know, could be physical strength, balance in the saddle coordination, improvement in self-confidence, self-control, they have get, gain social interactions and the development of social skills, working towards goals, sequencing events, being in nature, building relationships, and most importantly, they gain that access to sports and exercise. So how is adaptive or therapeutic riding delivered? The majority of organizations offering adaptive or therapeutic riding are charities or nonprofits. There are a few certified instructors that provide um, these programs as for profit. Riding lesson plans are created by an instructor and they involve adapted riding and horsemanship skills, activities and goals. Typically, um, we are teaching a beginner riding lesson so that incorporates all of the very basic arena figures and maneuvers. So that might be an introduction to walk, halt, transitions, um, 20 meter circles, loop along the long side, introducing the trot, um, posting at a trot, maybe ground poles. So we also use trained volunteers to support the riders from the ground. Um, we have a horse handler and a side walker. They could be on either side or just one side of the horse. Also, um, we might have interpreters in the arena. So if the rider is hearing impaired, they might have their American Sign Language interpreter in the arena with them to help interpret what the instructor is saying. Typically, adaptive or therapeutic riding lessons are in a group setting, so they're group lessons. The riders typically attend the riding sessions once a week, and the lessons are about 30 minutes to an hour. Some, some programs may offer like a 5, 8, 10, 12 week program that the riders would attend the weekly sessions. Um, it could also be that um, uh, there's a couple sessions over the year. So in the lesson plans, um, we start off with mounting. So you can see in the picture there, we um, incorporate a mounting ramp. So this just brings the rider up to a higher level on the horse, so it's easier for them to mount, and it's easier on the instructor and on the horse's back. We might also incorporate lifts to assist in the mount to help the rider um, get into the saddle. Once everyone is mounted and we've done all our tack checks and our safety checks, we then move into introductions. So we introduce the riders, the volunteers, the horses, so everyone knows each other. And then we introduce the lesson topic, which might be the walk halt transition, 20 meter circle. Then we move into the rider warm up to get them limber in the saddle. So they might be doing some trunk rotations, maybe some arm stretches to open up their upper body. 
once the riders are warmed up, um, then we move into the actual riding lesson. And that's where we're teaching the riding skills. And we're teaching the aids, how to use the reins, their leg aids, and also their seat. We also incorporate progressions into the lesson um, so that the, um, the riders can improve and stretch themselves in the lesson. Once that's complete, we then do a little game or an activity. This makes it very fun and it just reinforces the learning. Then we do a debrief at the end of the session and the instructor will probably ask some questions of the riders depending on their ability to determine um, evidence of learning. And then we dismount. In adaptive or therapeutic riding, we use adaptive tack. Um, so as you can see there, we might use a lift to help assist in mounting the rider. We could use rainbow reins, they're those colored reins at the bottom, or ladder reins, they're reins with loops on. And another piece of equipment that we use might be Devonshire boots. So there might be a rider that um, needs to wear an ankle foot orthoses, which is a very large um, sort of um, orthotic that goes inside their shoe and it makes it difficult for them to wear a regular riding boot so they can wear their runners with their ankle foot orthoses when we use the Devonshire boot and it prevents the foot from sliding through the stirrup. Other things that we might use for adaptive tack might be a sheepskin saddle cover um, if the rider has uh, soreness in their seat. So to give you an example as to how we use some of this adaptive equipment, I'd like to share Casper's story. So Casper is a rider at Urban Stable. I've changed his name um, to protect his identity, but he struggled with coordination and fine motor skills. So how we adapted the lesson for him is we actually used colored wristbands on his wrist. So when he was in the saddle, um, he had a difficulty distinguishing between right and left. So the colored wristbands really assisted him in um, knowing which way to turn. We also, um, when we were teaching the lessons, we would use the arena letters that are used for dressage, arena markers, and we'd also use cones. So we'd create a little channel with the cones so that Casper knew where to come off the rail, say if we were doing a loop on the long side, the cones would be there as an indication to show him how to move off the rail, off the wall, and to start his loop, and then to um, steer back to the rail again. And as he progressed, we would remove some of those cones. So as Casper attended Urban Stable, um, he really improved his coordination with left and right. Um, he had a little bit of, um, instability in the saddle, but working each week, um, he improved his balance in the saddle and his fine motor skills at Urban Stable. We incorporate grooming and tacking up. And um, as the weeks passed and the repetition of the grooming and tacking, it really improved Casper's um, fine motor skills, especially when it came to doing up the small buckles on the English saddle and in the tacking up process. This also improved sequencing of his tasks. So who receives adaptive or therapeutic riding? Who are the riders? So the riders may have physical, um, like visible or invisible disabilities. They might have cognitive, social, emotional, neurological disabilities, and they're facing barriers that require adaptations to access horseback riding. They could be children, youth or adults um, that um, need to um, access it with adapted means. Riding instruction is offered to riders of all abilities, and this could be from the very first contact to a horse um, all the way up to advanced independent riders. I'm going to share with you maybe some of the um, uh, medical conditions that a rider might present with, but just to be aware there might be precautions or contraindications to horseback riding. But riders that may present at an adaptive or therapeutic riding program may have um, a learning disability, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, visual impairment, hearing impairment, maybe genetic disorders, multiple sclerosis, 
amputation, orthopedic conditions, spina bifida. That's just a few of the examples. But as I mentioned, some medical conditions will ha may have a precaution or a contraindication to horseback riding. So I'd like to share with you um, Brigitte's story. So um, Brigitte um, attended Urban Stable as well. I've changed her name to protect her identity, but she struggled um, as she learned in a different way to everybody else. And she was very shy and quiet. So how we adapted her lessons is we used uh, rainbow reins. So you might be able to see in the picture here, this is Rufus. He's one of our horses at Urban Stable and he is, um, uh, modeling the rainbow rings for us so we can see them in action. So how this helped Brigitte is um, when you're teaching riding, um, you may need to ask your riders to shorten the reins as an example. And this might be um, as you may be coming to a downward transition or you're asking for a backup with your horse. And with um, Brigitte, she found that concept um, very difficult to understand. So using the colors as a visual cue on the reins, we could ask Brigitte to move her hands up the reins to the blue color, and that would in make her shorten her reins. And then she could perform the maneuver much more easily. We also incorporated very short sentences and we broke the skills down to very small baby steps. And the stable routine of grooming, tacking, mounting, riding, dismounting, that really improved Brigitte's self-confidence and her self-esteem. And being in that calm um, environment of the stable really improved her social interactions. And Brigitte got the confidence to start talking to her peers, volunteers, and she also started teaching some of the other riders as well. So who are the providers? Who are the instructors for adaptive or therapeutic riding? So adaptive or therapeutic riding instructor, instructors have additional training to assist the riders in the saddle and on the ground. So they could be Canadian Therapeutic Riding Association, which is shortened to CANTRA, Certified Therapeutic Riding Instructors, or PATH, International Certified Therapeutic Riding Instructors. Also trained volunteers are used. So horse handlers or horse leaders, they would be um, trained volunteers that have a lot of horse experience and they would be specifically trained for the job. So they're responsible for leading the horse and providing direction and reinforcement to the horse of the rider's cues and riding aids. So it might be that having a beginner rider on the horse's back, um, the communication might not be very clear. So the horse handler would be there to reinforce that. So if the student is asking the horse to turn right, the horse handler will just reinforce that and say, yes, the student wants to turn right. Also having a beginner rider on the horse's back, they not knowing what um, they want to do can maybe be a little bit um, nervous for the horse. So the horse handler is there to uh, reassure them and to encourage them that yes, they've got it, they know their job and they're there to assist them. Other trained volunteers would be sidewalkers and they are specifically trained to support the student on one or both sides of the horse and they walk next to the rider's leg or the girth area of the horse, and they are there in case assistance is needed under the guidance of the instructor. So it might be that they need to provide a sidewalker hold um, to provide extra support and stability in the saddle, or it could be that the student um, maybe didn't understand the instructor. So the sidewalk can be there to help the students say, oh yes, we're gonna stop in a moment and just reinforce that instruction that is needed. So the CANTRA instructor, so the CANTRA therapeutic writing instructor, um, their website is there. And I'm just gonna give you a summary of certification requirements. So you need to have evidence of equine handling, writing and management skills. You need to have experience working with individuals with disabilities, volunteer experience with, with a therapeutic riding program, and a video demonstration teaching a class of one to four riders, depending on which level of certification you're going for. And that video demonstration needs to include riding instruction, the communication of the riding skills, 
the aids and of mounting and dismounting. Uh, documentation of supervised instruction of adaptive riding, standard first aid and adult and child CPR, a home study and student report, and then a passing score in the written exam and oral questions. And so to learn more about Cantra, you can uh, go on their website, www.cantra.ca. Or it could be a PATH International Instructor. So PATH International Certified Therapeutic Writing instruction, Instructors. Um, to uh, gain certification, um, you need evidence of equine handling skills, evidence of equine management skills, experience working with individuals with disabilities, a video demonstration <clears throat> of writing instruction and communication of writing skills, documentation of supervised instruction of adaptive writing lessons, child and adult CPR and first aid, and a passing score of the PATH standards exam. So to learn more about PATH and certification, the website is www.pathintl.org. So um, horse considerations for adaptive or therapeutic riding. As it is a riding lesson, a good lesson horse or school horse would be a good choice. Training of the horse, if they have training in both Western and English disciplines, that would be a benefit. And if they have some dressage background, that would be good. Or, and a school background as well. If they've used to working in arena, working with other horses in the arena and having lots of people around. A horse with a lot of life experience is really good. So maybe they've been on parades, maybe they've, they've been trailered, they're used to trailering a school horse, like I mentioned, <clears throat> or it could be that they've been part of a 4-H or pony club program. And horses, they do need to be comfortable with having people around them. So as you saw in those pictures earlier, there is the rider, we have the horse handler and maybe one or two sidewalkers. So being a prey animal, um, that's a lot of people in their personal bubble. So the horses need to be comfortable having those people around them. And they need to be habituated and comfortable with props. We use a lot of fun props in our games like fuzzy dice and things like that. They also need to be comfortable um, with wheelchairs. Those would be unfamiliar objects to them in the arena. So they need to be habituated to that. Also, if your therapeutic riding center is using a lift, um, that would be something that's coming up above over the horse's withers. It might be combined with a mechanical noise. So the horses need to be um, accustomed and um, comfortable with that. Also comfortable with the adaptive tack and the warm up exercises. So it might be that um, the rider is doing those trunk rotations, their arms might be coming up and away from the body. So the horses need to be comfortable with that. The riders might also be asked to stretch forward to touch the horse's ears or behind to touch the tail. And the horse needs to be comfortable with all those things. And they also need to be able to tolerate an unbalanced beginner rider. So some of the riders that are coming for adaptive or therapeutic riding, they might be even more unbalanced, maybe sitting on one side of their saddle more than the other, um, compared to maybe um, uh, an, uh, a beginner rider that doesn't have any um, uh, special uh, needs. So other horse preparations and considerations, this um, has come from, um, this come from Cantra. Um, so these are some of the things that they suggest in a good adaptive or therapeutic lesson horse. So between age of five to 15, but I've also seen horses up into their twenties be a good lesson horse for adaptive or therapeutic riding. They just need to be enjoying the, their job. Um, height is a, uh, an important consideration, 4.2 to 15.2 hands high, and um, you need to take in consideration your rider, horse, and if you're using sidewalkers, um, assignments. So if you have a rider that's riding on a 16 hand horse and you do require a sidewalker, that's going to be very hard for them to reach. So you need to 
uh, consider the height of your horse, the height of your sidewalkers, and how much support your rider needs in the saddle when they're doing the adaptive or therapeutic riding. Your horse needs to be sound and have no vices, healthy, up to date on vaccinations. They need to be comfortable being led from both sides. They need to be able to stand quietly for mounting and for long periods of time, maybe during games or debrief and um, during tack check. The horse needs to be quiet, but not lazy. And if you have a rider that is very unbalanced in the saddle, maybe consider having a horse with a smooth gait might be beneficial. Um, if your horse has a good confirmation, that would be an asset, but it's not essential. And good ground manners is very important. They, you want to make sure that your horse doesn't nip when being led. And very briefly here, we'll just touch on, um, there is opportunity for friendly competition. Um, so um, the Special Olympics Ontario um, in spring 2022, they were the first Special Olympics equestrian team approved at Hope Haven Pegasus. And then there's also opportunity um, for para equestrian. So we have there um, Lauren Barwick, she's Canada's most celebrated equestrian, para equestrian athlete. Uh, Stina Kastrup, see she is the Danish FEI world champion para equestrian and Debbie Cribble, she's the British para equestrian gold medalist. So thank you very much for your time this evening. If you'd like to learn more about Urban Stable, um, you can check out our website at www.urbanstable.ca. And to learn more about uh, Cantra and Path, um, you can um, uh, see their uh, website addresses there. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Nina. Haley, thank you so much for a wonderful and clear presentation on adaptive riding, also known as therapeutic riding. And as we've talked throughout this symposium with a focus on human health and learning services, we felt still, even though adaptive riding, again, also known as therapeutic riding, is not one of those services, we felt it important to bring in an expert like Haley to talk about what it is and what it isn't. And one of the questions that have come in is, why do you think it's um, so easy to get confused about what therapeutic riding is and isn't. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Yes, of course. I think uh, the question is, why do you think, Kaylee, it's so easy to get confused, despite your very clear presentation, about what therapeutic riding is and isn't? Yes, excellent question. Um, uh, there's so many activities where horses are being used, but adaptive or therapeutic riding is um, horseback riding lessons that have been adapted to the individual's um, uh, unique abilities, um, their needs, and also the uh, learning environment um, is also accommodated so that they can learn um, according to their abilities. Right. Yes. And I, I, you know, I can't help but think that the term that's so common, therapeutic riding, may sometimes confuse people. It sounds like it could be part of, of, of you know, some sort of treatment or some sort of focus that is not riding skills. But as, you know, Lynn, our previous speaker, also emphasized, we've had some terminology developments here in the past few years where, for instance, the term adaptive riding has really been sort of lifted up or, or, or kind of presented as this might be a really accurate way to describe what in fact is happening in these uh, riding lessons. And a, a kind of another question on the heels of that um, is how do we uh, be clear about uh, kind of the professional roles. So for instance, what if a, a therapeutic writing instructor uh, is also trained in a different area? I could even use myself because I'm a credentialed therapeutic writing instructor uh, through PATH International. I'm also a psychologist. I'm a mental health professional. So how can we, you know, what advice would you give to be clear what service or what thing is happening when, even if a person might have multiple trainings sort of in their in their backpack. 
<coughs> excuse me, yes, I would be very clear as to what service you're providing. When you are providing those riding lessons that have been adapted to people's special needs, then that's what you're delivering. And then you would make sure that it's very clear as to how you're marketing yourself. If you wanted to use those other skills, um, I think you would need to, um, I mean, the great skills that they could bring to everyone, everyone can benefit from them. But when you're advertising yourself and um, talking about your programs, I think you need to wear one hat or the other. So you're either doing the adaptive writing or you're providing the therapy. And just to make that very clear for the public as to, as to what you're providing. Yes, I think that really um, kind of fits in so nicely with the with the conversation about goals um, that Lynn and I just had here earlier, you know, if you are if you are focusing on writing goals, you should focus on writing goals and provide that valuable activity to people with disabilities who want to recreate and want to be around horses. If you're mm -hmm. focusing on learning goals like the ones that um, I sort of rattled off there from Lynn's presentation, uh, team building, um, motivation, things like that then your service is designed differently and you have to have the training and of course the same for therapy. So yeah, I appreciate that Haley, very clear answer. Uh, a final question for you uh, actually is a question that also comes up in other parts of the horse world, especially in riding school settings, which is essentially what an adapted riding lesson is, which is how do we help horses who are around uh, novel or beginner riders or riders who have different movement needs from being, uh, from sort of losing connection to what signaling and cues mean, uh, especially leg cues. What, uh, in, and somewhat briefly, because we are ready to start wrapping up here, but I thought that was a very important question. Um, yes, um, I would recommend um, lots of schooling. So um, have your instructor um, school the horses to try and really reinforce um, this is what the leg ed feels like. These are what the rain aids are. And then that is part of being a riding instructor. If you have a rider up there um, that is maybe moving their legs a lot, that may be moving in the saddle a lot, is to really try and bring awareness to that, to the rider, and so that they can develop that self-awareness of themselves in the saddle, because that's part of riding instruct instruction, so that they can try and work on um, keeping their core muscles engaged and using their seat and trying to relax their legs down into the, and their weight down into their heels so that um, the, the legs aren't moving and causing confusion with the horse. And it's just consistent training, knowing what the instructor is saying, the horse handlers, and that that same communication is passed on to the horse. It's consistency. I find a lot with riding um, like lesson horses, they're handled by so many people, but, if all of those people could handle them in the same consistent manner, that really is very beneficial for the horses. It really helps them um, understand what everybody is asking. So if somebody applies the inside leg um, as, a, as, a, as, as an aid in the saddle, if everyone is applying that in the same way, then the horse knows, oh, okay, that means I need to bend around your leg and move away from the pressure. So it's just consistency and trying to get everyone that's handling those horses to do it the same. And then if you notice that the horse is struggling to get those schooling rides in, so have your advanced rider or the instructor get up there and help school the horse through these different things. And it's really supporting the horse and listening to, um, to how they're coping. Yes, wonderful answer with lots of good um, tips and techniques, and especially around that idea of consistency in mm -hmm. lessons. Thank you so much, Haley, for your talk. We have now come to the final moments of the 2022 Equine Industry Symposium with a focus on horses in human health and learning. And I, for one, am delighted to have been with you all for the three evenings. Um, more information about 
kind of closing matters and logistics will come in a moment. And I thought I'd just take um, uh, a couple of minutes to share um, some final take home messages. I hope you've found that our experienced speakers have been really focused on clarity and professionalism and not and, and focused on that each service area, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education and learning, um, or and or what we just talked about, this sort of separate area of adaptive or therapeutic writing, that each of these services or activities have a purpose. And the idea is that we can be really clear about them by our words and descriptions, and also by encouraging professionalism, meaning those that we seek who provide these services or writing activities, that they actually have credentials and they're able to explain to you, uh, if you're a parent or if you're a recipient yourself, what this is about without using those misleading terms, or as we saw in day one in the science of human horse interactions, not misunderstanding the real and true and valuable role that horses have without us sort of making some things up about that. I see a lot of future directions for this area or these areas, I should say, of horses in human healthcare services and horses in learning services, starting with these quite recent terminology efforts that Lynn Thomas also referenced today, that which will lead into more clarity when it comes to training providers. I think it's important for everybody here, if you are a healthcare provider, if you are a learning services provider interested in being one, that currently training in these areas is quite unregulated and it falls on you to do your research, look for professional competencies from the various professional organizations related to the human professions, such as psychotherapy or occupational therapy, and really make an informed choice. Because again, everybody can provide training, but there's a lot of really good and valuable trainings um, out there. And my final note is, for those of you who are interested in research in these areas, I'm happy to say that more and more journals have continued being open access, meaning you don't have to be a student or affiliated with a university to read some good research. Um, and I encourage you also to reach out to professionals in this area and get their input and, and help when you're starting to make decisions. Thank you again for your time. Again, thank you again for featuring these important areas uh, and the whole Equine Industry Symposium organizing body. I will now turn it over to Zena one last time. Perfect, thank you so much, Nina. I want to now end off the night by saying a big, big thank you to all of our speakers tonight, Lynn Thomas and Haley Edwards as well as to all of our speakers from the previous nights. We are very grateful for you all taking your time and educating us. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors and our partners, Ontario Equestrian, Equine Guelph, our official media sponsor, KX94.7, Schlieff Saddlery, and Golden Horseshoe PEMF Therapy. And last but not least, a great thank you to everyone who attended tonight and came out to learn more about the equine industry and the use of horses in human healthcare. We hope that everyone enjoyed learning from our wonderful speakers and is interested in learning more about the horses in human health. Please take a few moments to fill out a survey via the link in the chat. Your feedback is very important to us and will help us to plan our future equine industry symposiums. If you'd like to learn more about the BBRM equine management program, you can visit the University of Guelph website under academic programs and Bachelor of Bio Resource Management. The link for that will also be in the chat as well. Again, please take two minutes to provide feedback via the link in the survey. And now for our final wrap up, I'll pass it back to Amanda. Hi everyone, uh, I'll be very brief. Um, couldn't have said it, said it any better than Zaina. Um, I just wanted to add an additional thank you to Zaina herself, uh, to uh, Marina Smith, to Braylon Collins Robb, uh, who were speakers uh, earlier in the week for this event and all of the other students who worked all semester um, to do such an incredible job. So. Um, hats off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you to our partners. Uh, thank you to the entire uh, Equine Industry Symposium uh, Committee. 
uh, we're done for this year, but our planning for next year starts again tomorrow. Uh, well, maybe on Monday. So um, if you are if you are an equine business or an organization who is um, interested in, in helping us with this important, important event, please feel free to reach out on our social media. And again, thank you everybody for attending and uh, have a great evening.